Okay, so it's time to look at Faraday's Law. And this is all about what happens when you change the value of the magnetic field. So let's start with the review. This is the electric field due to a point charge. So on the left here, I have a positive point charge and the yellow arrows represent the electric field pointing radially outward. Over here, I have a negative charge. The blue one's a negative charge with the field pointing inward. But both of these have this radial pattern of the electric field. And even if I combine them together and make a dipole, they're still the same idea. Electric fields point away from positive charges and towards negative charges. These are usually associated with electric charges. So I'm going to call these Coulomb, a Coulomb field. That's the shape. Here is a tiny little piece of electric current, the yellow thing, and the blue arrows, the cyan arrows, represent the magnetic field, and they make this circular pattern around the wire. And we've seen this before, this is a review. But it's significantly different than the electric field, the pattern for electric field. Those point away from charges or toward charges. These make circles. So I'm going to call these curly magnetic fields. It's a curly field. And I'm stealing that both those terms from Matter and Interactions, one of my favorite physics textbooks. Uh, so, and this I made this di this diagram in VPython, but just so you know. Okay, so let's look at an example. So here I have a coil of wire, and I'm moving a magnet in that coil of wire, and the coil of wire is connected to this small device called a galvanometer that measures very small electric currents. And you'll notice that the needle moves when the magnet is moved into the coil or out of the coil. If I just keep the magnet in the coil, I get no current. Okay, so magnetic fields do not create a current, but changing magnetic fields do create a current, and this is part of Faraday's law. Let's look at another demo, and I didn't make this demo, but this is uh, from the, the links down here on glowscript.org. Go to the examples, and you can find this. This is a animation of a magnet. The red part of the mag that little cylinder is the North Pole, and then we have some area near it. There's nothing really there. This is just a uh, an area that we describe. Okay, there's no doesn't have to be anything there. So if I look at the green arrows, they show the direction of the magnetic field. And as I move that magnet towards the area, the magnetic field changes. And when the magnetic field changes, it creates these yellow arrows, which are electric fields. And these are curly electric fields. So changing magnetic fields make curly electric field. That's kind of cool if you think about it, because we have this curly fields we think of with magnetic fields. But you can actually get curly electric fields from a changing magnetic field. Now, what is the relationship between the changing magnetic field and the electric field? Well, to do that, we need to look at a new idea called flux. So I, a lot of people think about, when they think about flux, they think of the flux capacitor. Okay, because that, that's from back, back to the Future. It was what makes time travel possible. I mean, it's not a real thing, but I just want to point out it's a great word, right? Because you take two scientific words, you put them together, you make something that's not real, but it sounds really cool, and that's what movies are all about. Okay, so let's look at rain flux. Rain flux tells you how much rain is hitting a particular object. And so here I have rain, these balls coming down, uh, rain is raindrops are not actually raindrop shaped, just so you know. Uh, and then this purple box is uh, like a sheet of paper. That's my area. So the rain flux depends on first the rain rate. The faster it rains, the more rain is going to hit that piece of paper. It depends on the size of the paper. A bigger sheet of paper, more rain is going to hit that paper. And finally, it depends on the angle between this line that's normal to the paper and the rain. So you would get the maximum rain flux if theta was zero. If theta was zero, then the, the sheet of paper would be perpendicular to the rain and you'd get as much hitting as possible. If I rotate theta to 90 degrees, then no rain would hit the paper. It would all just move right past it. So that's that angle theta. So we can use the same idea for magnetic flux. So we use the Greek symbol capital Phi and the B means it's magnetic flux instead of gravitational flux or electric flux. And it's a scalar product, but it depends on two vector quantities, the magnetic field and the area vector. And that A in hat is the area vector. Don't worry if you don't like that. 
because I won't make you use that. I'm just trying to be, you know, legit. So a better way that you might like the magnetic flux is the strength of the magnetic field times the magnitude of the area times the cosine of the angle between theta and b. And so you'll notice here that uh, this vector n hat is perpendicular to the area. That's the way we define area vectors. Uh, and you will also notice that in this particular case, the magnetic field and theta and n hat are in opposite x directions. And this would give you a negative flux. That's cool. Okay, You can have negative flux. Uh, it just depends on how you define that area. And that, may ma that matters in some other situations. Here, it doesn't really matter. Okay, so that's the magnetic flux. This formula only works if the magnetic field doesn't change in space, so constant in space, and the area doesn't change. So imagine if you had like a, a sphere, the surface area of a sphere, that would be a non-constant area vector, right? Every different part of it points in different directions. So you'd have to do something more complicated to calculate the flux, but we're not going to do that. Okay, so imagine I have a, an area in space with the magnetic field, the blue circles with the X's, and that magnetic field is going into the paper, and it's changing. And that produces a curly electric field, which I've shown as the red arrow. Now, what if I integrate? Okay, so that's the first thing. The curly electric field is made by the changing magnetic field. Now, suppose I, I find the change in potential going around that loop. And you'll notice it's not... It's not a Coulomb field. So I'm always going to be moving in the same direction as the electric field. When I get back to the same point, it's not going to be zero. So the change in potential around this loop is not zero. Not zero volts. And so since it's not zero volts, it acts like it's uh, a battery. And that battery, that electric field can make a current if there's a wire there. Okay. And uh, this is not a battery. Don't worry about that negative sign. Look at this equation first, and then I'll go back to the negative sign. So what we say here is that the electromotive force, which is a voltage, remember, if you think back to the way we talked about batteries, that's just the, uh, that's the change in potential when you go around that loop. It's not zero. But instead, it depends on the change in magnetic flux divided by the change in time. That's the, that tells you how fast your flux is changing. The capital letter N, it tells you how many loops you have. If you have one loop, then you calculate the change in flux over the change in time, and you're all set. What if you have 10 loops? Well, each one of those loop loops has a ch same change in flux, so they kind of all build up. So if you have 10 loops, you'd multiply the change in flux by 10. And that's why we use, in the demo before, I had a big coil with a whole bunch of loops. Okay, now what about the negative sign? If you look in the textbook, most textbooks are going to have a negative sign there in front of the end. I don't put it there. Okay, because it depends on really how you calculate the EMF, which way you go around the loop, whether there should be a negative sign or not. And I think it's just not needed. Uh, we want to calculate the change in flux and use that to calculate the EMF around a loop. Uh, and then if you want to find out which way the current is going, we need to use something else. Okay, and that something else is Linz's Law. Okay, so we have a changing magnetic field makes a curly electric field. That curly electric field can make an electric current. That electric current can make a magnetic field. So now we have two magnetic fields and it starts getting confusing. Now here's the deal. The direction of the induced magnetic field opposes the change in magnetic flux. So, or you could think of it this way. The, and this is Linz's law. This tells you the direction of the current. changing magnetic field makes a flux that makes an electric current, and that current wants to keep the flux the same. It doesn't want the flux to change. Okay, that's the way to think about it. Although when I say want, it doesn't really want. These things aren't real. They don't, you know, I want uh, to eat some pizza, but magnetic flux doesn't really want something. I'm just kind of talking here. Okay. So here are two examples. Look at the one on the left. I have a magnet moving towards a coil. In this case, I'm increasing the flux to the left because as I move that magnet towards her, the magnetic field inside the loop increases. So that creates a current that wants to make a magnetic field that opposes that change and be a magnetic field to the right, induced magnetic field. Now I can use my right-hand rule. If I put my thumb in the direction of the induced magnetic field, 
my, the fingers of my right hand go in the direction of the induced current. Now, this other one's a little bit more difficult because it has a constantly changing magnetic field. I know that sounds weird, constantly changing. So the coil of wire is just a giant coil of wire and it's plugged straight into the AC outlet. And that, has, that creates a changing electric current, which creates a changing magnetic field. The changing magnetic field due to the giant coil induces a current in that aluminum ring. That aluminum ring has a current now that makes a magnetic field to oppose the changing magnetic field. And then that's what makes it repel and the, the ring gets shot up into there and it's pretty cool. That's called a ring launcher. Okay, so this is complicated stuff. If it doesn't make sense to you, you're gonna need to do some practice problems and we're gonna do some problems in some future videos, but just like letting you know, I understand that there's a lot of stuff going on here and it's pretty complicated, okay? But we're gonna work some problems and I will talk to you physics people later.